I'll start another recording. So today we're going to look at mathematics and science. And if you have further questions about your assignments, happy to answer those as well. And we're looking at the challenge of teaching mathematics and teaching science. We're looking a little bit at the history of mathematics and science, and in particular, the usefulness of mathematics and science when students think, when we think, and in critical thinking. Let's begin uh, as Christians with a Bible reading and prayer, Psalm 94. Um, we're reminded that um, does not he who fashioned the ear not hear, that is God, does he who formed the eye not see, does he not discipline nations, nor punishment and teach mankind lack knowledge, the Lord knows all human plans, they are futile, blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach your law, and notice here, that we begin with a natural theology looking at we have an ear and eye, but the one who makes us, he must understand the hear and the eye. And in science, if we were to um, do biology, then we could reflect on the God who makes the ear or the eye. Also, from the psalm, we're reminded that we have a God who cares for us. Verse 17, unless the Lord had helped me when I write my assignments, when I struggle, um, I would have dealt the silence of death of those who fail. My foot is slipping. Uh, you're unfolded, failing love, Lord. Support me when I struggle to understand my assignments. When anxiety is great within me, you consolidate me. You bring me joy. So hopefully that reminds us that God is with us in all the challenges of life, including assignment writing, perhaps. And then a prayer. You hold the whole creation in your hands from the vast, awesome universe to each tiny grain of sand. You're the creator of all time. You balance night and day within a mathematical framework, infinite and safe. And so in this prayer, we're reminded that God cares for all that he's created and therefore, he understands all that he's created. And therefore, in terms of mathematics and science, God must be the author of maths and science and understand them. And so maths and science should not be something that we fear. Um, it reminds us that God, who is a God of order, has given us um, these understandings of the world through maths and understandings of the world through science, and they should be helpful and useful for us. Um, Libby, what are your thoughts <clears throat> on both a Christian God-oriented view of maths and science? Um, is this helpful? Were the readings uh, helpful on how we can see maths and science from a positive perspective rather than a fear of maths and science perspective. Uh, thoughts, Libby? Yeah, well, I absolutely love the, that session last week on maths. Um, I have had a fear of math. Um, and just from a Christian perspective, um, looking at the world that God created through order, there was one of the videos that was talking about how there's so much symmetry and, um, and, and patterns in nature. So I really love the, the spirals of the shells and the waves and the storms and how um, you can see so much mathematics in, in, in that nature. Um, and I think it's opened my eyes. I think I really hope wished when I was young that I had someone that was able to explain that in that view and maybe that would have changed my appreciation for math or maybe I wouldn't have had that fear. Um, I think I'm a very visual per person and um, studying math was very re repetitious and in the same way and I had to do pages and pages of the same thing but um, I'm quite a creative sort of person and I think I needed to see it in, in lots of different ways to actually understand it. And I like some of the answers you give there, Libby, too, to the challenge is in that if maths is creative, then we can do creative activities. That is, we can introduce art into maths and we can draw um, various um, 
uh, artistic projects in maths. And so we can encourage people to explore um, using the more creative uh, approaches there in maths. So um, really value that. Hannah, uh, your thought on this Christian God-oriented perspective on maths. Hannah. Um, I, I kind of see it as God's given the idea of like maths and science to us to help us understand what he's created um, kind of in a way that in a simpler way for us but also at the same time it can be it can be scary for people to then join in and do but like um, Lou was saying seeing it all in the world that he created makes it personal and makes it fun I guess um, yeah and it can be it can be scary, can't it? Because if God makes the world, it's like looking at the architecture plans for the Sydney Opera House. They can be scary, complex, um, and it can be challenging to understand them. And we might think we don't need to understand the plans of the Sydney Opera House, but at the same time, uh, to see those plans um, can leave us in awe, um, and it can encourage us that we too could use similar skills in maths and science and engineering. So it can be very inspiring. And I know some of the best teachers I've had in maths have been inspiring teachers who have encouraged me uh, to uh, look at potential and possibility in uh, maths and what can be uh, done in uh, maths. Um, I'm interested in um, the ways in which you can use creative activities. For instance, if we're talking about the maths formula for area, length times breadth, we could talk about tiling a floor and you could even bring in actual tiles or you could even cut out tiles. And particularly in prep and year one and two, uh, you could cut out these 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre tiles and you could tile the top of a table and you could say, how many tiles will we need? So we can make it very practical and uh, creative. Uh, interestingly, a triangle is half this size. So you could talk about um, the calculation of the area of a triangle is half of length times breadth or half base times height. So you could move into more complex areas. And then you could also move into a circle. So how would you work out the area of a circle? So it's not like a rectangle. It's not like a um, uh, a triangle, uh, a circle is more complex, but you could do exercises where you get the students to sit around a table in groups of two, three or four, and they could try and come up with ways of working out the area of a circle um, for a pie dish. And you could say, we're going to actually sell these pies and we want to know what the area is. And you could make it a practical exercise. You could even cook the pies afterwards. You could make circles out of pastry and uh, you could make it very hands-on and uh, practical. You could do an artistic work where you you cut out the circles and you paste them and you draw faces and do all sorts of areas. And then if you've got more advanced primary school students or more advanced students, you could uh, then go on to the whole theory of the circumference of a circle is two times uh, the radius times pi. Um, it's this magic number, 3.14. And again, why has God given us a magic number of 3.14 whereby constantly Every circle has this same formula, and why doesn't it change? And this is what led the ancient Greeks, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle to say, there must be a God behind all of these things because we have these constants. Um, it's magical the way in which we have the area of a circle is always the same. You could go from one side of the earth to the other and you're still going to have the same formula and you're still going to have to multiply by 3.14, um, the number pi. And so uh, it's a very interesting uh, question as to why this is constant. And one of the interesting exercises is that if I was to give 10 of your students a piece of paper and you were to write down two apples plus two 
uh, apples equals, and I can get you to write this down for apples, is the meaning of 2 plus 2 equals 4 in the ink that you have used to write on the paper? It's not in the ink. Ink can't think. Where is the meaning? And Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle said, it's in the mind of God. It's in the very framework of the universe before the universe is created, underlying the universe. Because if you screw up all those pieces of paper that have got two plus two equals four on it, that won't get rid of the fact that two plus two equals four. Where is two plus two equals four? And so Pythagoras and Plato felt that it was located in the mind of God. And the same with if I got you to write down the words of uh, Shakespeare, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? Is that in the words that you've written down? Is that in your mind? Is that in which you read? Or is it really in the mind of Shakespeare who wrote those words? And in many ways, it's in the mind of Shakespeare who writes it. And the same with two plus two equals four. So if mathematics reflects the um, framework of the universe, who makes the framework of the universe? And so there are people who believe that God and Christians believe that God makes this framework and that it exists apart from God. And Plato uh, over in Greece believed it. Old New Testament, Moses, Isaiah, Jesus, Paul, they all have this understanding that God makes the framework of the universe. And what's exciting about this is that you can not only read the writing of God when you read the Gospels and Jesus' words, you can read the writing of God when you do maths. So when you write 2 plus 2 equals 4, you're actually writing down some of the words of God. And so maths as the words of God could be very, very exciting to be engaging with the language of God that was used to construct the universe around you. And one person who got very excited by this was Einstein. So Albert Einstein, he did a bit of math study and he was very excited as a Jewish person with a Jewish background that he might be working with the language of the universe. And he applied to get a job teaching at university, et cetera. But he got rejected. He didn't get a teaching job. And so the job that Einstein got was working in a patents office, you know, where they say this patent goes okay and this one doesn't go okay. And so Einstein, working in the patents office, when he had a bit of spare time, he'd look out the window and see a train charging along and he'd start to think about um, what the train moving and whether its speed was relative or whether it changed. And he wrote what he saw down in uh, mathematical language and... Uh, and he then wrote it up and he began to do, continue to work with his um, ideas. And um, uh, he wrote these up and then Einstein in one year wrote up and published, one of the papers he published was only about um, a page or so uh, long. And so, um, uh, Albert Einstein's uh, Christian views um, were quite uh, powerful. And so Einstein published paper famous. Let's see if it'll give me the year. Um, so in 1905, he published four papers. And from that time, um, uh, every university in the world wanted Albert Einstein and uh, they would all give him a job, I think. So if you get rejected for a teaching job, realise that there could be another day when uh, things work very, very well. Um, interestingly, uh, just a couple of days um, 
a short while ago, I had a chance to pop into Oxford University, as everyone does, and um, uh, they have the blackboard there um, where Albert Einstein visited Oxford in 1930 and he wrote up some of his equations. And uh, one of the famous equations that he wrote up was uh, E equals MC squared. So in his thinking uh, about the way God's made the universe, he thought we've got energy, we've got matter, they're related. And he played around with the mathematical relationship. And he said, if we could get matter to convert to energy, um, type, 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 he worked it all out, um, we would have E equals MC squared. So 1905, he published four papers on his mathematical reflections, and it was his uh, year, and one of those papers was E equals MC squared. Energy equals speed of light um, time squared times uh, matter. And uh, over in America, they use that and they develop the atomic bomb and atomic energy and nuclear power stations. And all of that flowed from Einstein's appreciation of the way the universe has been made. Before him, Isaac Newton was also another um, student who was fascinated with mathematics and his fascination with mathematics, very strong believer in God and he'd sit in church and not only listening to the sermon, he'd see the swinging of the light a little bit. And he thought, oh, I could come up with a theory of the pendulum. So he worked out how pendulums work. And he published that as the major theory of the pendulum. Another time, possibly sitting in church, he saw the light coming through the window. And he thought, maybe white light is made up of. And he came up with a theory of the spectrum. And light is made up of different spectrums. Another time, sitting outside the church, may have seen an apple fall and he came up with the theory of gravity. Um, he also looked at comets and uh, their tails and developed the theory of gravity. And um, uh, Newton became uh, the leading um, physicist of his time, fascinated with mathematics because he believed that God created the world behind it all. Um, and then uh, we have um, Leonardo da Vinci. Does anyone know what um, uh, uh, da Vinci, um, does anyone know what um, job Leonardo da Vinci had, his real job? His real job was an engineer. That is, he designed water systems and piping and all of that to carry your water around. Um, but he believed that um, the perfection behind all things, um, we need to reflect on God who makes the world and behind all things. Um, so we've got mathematics, God, um, Christianity. So if I do a search on that, we can uh, come up with uh, Leonardo's studies of uh, the way in which the universe is made. And uh, this is one of his uh, studies. Is it come? let me go there? Um, may not. And so we have these famous drawings where he seeks to work out um, uh, the uh, different dimensions of a human person. And even in his paintings and drawings, he's using his mathematical expertise to uh, complete these paintings and drawings. So again, mathematics can be very important and connected to these areas. But I digress. Mathematics reflecting the framework of the universe and God's uh, creation. Um, Mauricia, do you have some thoughts on the reading and what this meant? And uh, Matilda, do you have thoughts on mathematics? The Bible reading we had, the um, uh, videos that we've had on maths and God. Uh, Mauricia, your thoughts? Um, I've, I really liked these readings and I've, in a, my previous university I was with, I um, did a unit which was called the World of Maths, which obviously it was not a Christian university, so it sort of had a slightly different take on it. But um, 
that and this really sort of emphasize that the the beauty that can be found in maths and then I like the linking of that between just the beauty in God's creation um and that we were sort of given this uh, like someone else sort of said the ability to even see and understand that mathematically if that makes sense very much um, and this is what yeah yeah no, that, that's all yeah and very much that's what um leonardo da vinci was seeking to do was to um understand the beauty that god had placed in the universe and then to use that in his drawings and paintings just as he used it also in engineering and designing water systems that would carry uh, water so he's wrestling with that question what is the beauty that god has placed in the universe and from the time of the Greeks, uh, which is why they make all of those statues that they uh, make, they're reflecting on the beauty that God has placed in the universe. And so if there's a statue of a great Greek beauty you see in a Greek garden, it's because of that reflection on what God has created. And therefore, um, you paint and draw and make statues that reflect that. And up until the Middle Ages, there was a great link between beauty and science and mathematics. And it's only in more modern times that there has been a move away seeking to simplify maths and uh, not complicate it by linking it to beauty and God and um, all of these middle age as questions. One of the interesting things is that people were encouraged in the middle ages to study maths. So uh, Leonardo da Vinci and also Isaac Newton would have encouraged you to study maths and science for your spiritual formation. They would say that you become a better person as you do your mathematics, that you become a better person as you do your scientific reflections. And we forget that. We've lost that, that maths and science are meant to uh, be places where you reflect on the beauty of God, the goodness of God, the beauty and goodness of his creation. And in reflecting on that, you allow God to make you into the beautiful, good, well-designed person that is calling you to be. And certainly Isaac Newton and Leonardo da Vinci write in that manner, as did everyone up until about the 17 or 1800s. And then come along people like Galileo. Now, one of the reasons Galileo gets into trouble is that he does write in honour of God and he has paragraphs that saying in his reflection on what he seeks to study, we need to honour God, but he rushes into mathematics and he doesn't reflect on philosophy and Galileo doesn't reflect on theology and he doesn't spend so much time getting trained in theology and philosophy and Greeks thinking, he rushes into mathematics. And then Galileo hears that they have a new thing called the lenses that make up a telescope. And so he gets a hold of those. And then he looks out into um, the planets and he works out that the earth goes around the sun. And so he challenges the people at the time by writing up his writings. But one of the reasons he gets into trouble is because he's not including enough reflection on beauty and theology in his writings. And also he's not able to fully develop the mathematics that he needs. And it's about 10, 20 years after Galileo that the mathematics is fully developed that shows that the earth goes round the sun. And then, um, uh, yeah, there's a whole debate takes uh, place there. And the church were the leading mathematical thinkers up until that time, um, the 14, 1500s, and in more recent times, there's been uh, a separation of maths and science from um, ideas of beauty and theology. Karen, do you think we've lost something by separating maths and science from beauty and art and theology and God. Can I get everyone to write down perhaps a sentence where have we lost 
something. Separating maths and science from um, theology, which is reflection on God, um, philosophy, uh, metaphysics, what's the meaning of the universe, um, and also beauty and art. So up until 15, 16, 17, 18 hundred, when you wrote mathematics, you were encouraged to reflect on beauty and philosophy and method, physics. But after that time, there have been secularists <coughs> who said maths is simply two plus two equals four. It is not mm. reflection on all of these things. So Karen, so everyone's written something down. Karen, do you think we've lost something or do you think maths is better for it being simplified and not having um, these philosophical, theological reflections? Uh, absolutely not. I think that um, maths and science obviously go, I, well, I think they go hand in hand. However, we have to look at it, um, if we look at the other subjects, for example, so much of the maths and science can be um, overarched into art, can be overarched into um, music, for example, those sorts of things. So it's a deeper, it's a deeper connection than what, what we actually believe it is and what people want to believe. But I think today with our social media the way it is and people want just want to succeed and be known as... Um, you know, I suppose the scholarly person that either discovered something or proved something, that people aren't looking at the the backbone and the um, the basis of where it come from. And I like what you say about people looking at celebrities and uh, celebrities like to get a name for themselves and sometimes they get a name by attacking church or attacking tradition or attacking the way things were done and uh, they want to make things new and different and uh, you look at modern art you see aspects of that everyone's trying to outdo the other person in doing things in a new way in a celebrity way and we lose some of that connection with tradition and the past so i like that matilda do you have thoughts on this question maths and science um have we lost something separating them from other subjects music and art theology faith in god um, I actually, when, when I did the readings for um, the forum for last week with mathematics, I actually got really, really excited um, by it because I personally am a bit of a maths fanatic. Um, I, I really enjoy it and I really enjoyed actually doing um, the forum last week uh, because I loved the connections that um, the authors actually made between God and maths. Um, and I think it put into the perspective of like maths isn't a physical thing that we can hold. We can relate it to physical things. Um, we can relate it to, you know, two apples plus two apples equals four apples. Um, but in reality, it is just a way of thinking. It is a, a you know, function of the mind. And um, God has used that function to, you know, create everything that we know today. And so in understanding that you go, oh, well, then this is, you know, this is wisdom from God. This is a way of thinking that he uses, which I think is um, really beautiful. And so I got really excited by it because I'm quite a deep thinker. I love maths. I love God. So like putting that all together, it was really um, quite like a fun, fun uh, reading point for me. Um I think that by separating maths and science, it, you know, you have lost something because, you know, maths relates to music, maths relates to the way that, um, you know, there's a golden ratio with beauty. So it relates to beauty um, that, you know, it all has this beautiful connection because that's the way that God has made it. He's made everything to 
um, you know, come together in harmony and so that the world works in this beautiful way. You can't just explain it away with science. Science actually explains God's creation. It actually backs up his creation in the way that he's made things. So I think by separating the two, um, we've almost lost the harmoniousness between uh, like of creation because you're pulling apart, you know, the, the, I would say the foundations that God uses to explain all the beautiful things that he's made. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that, yeah, you've, lo you've lost connection and harmoniousness if you separate mathematics and science and say, oh, these are just academic things. They don't relate to the arts. They don't relate to, you know, beauty and theology and philosophy. It's like, no, they're actually, you know, they're your support system. They help explain and, they are what form the beauty and the ways that we think and all that. That's kind of what I feel about that question. <laughs> yeah. And, and I like your thoughts on celebrating mathematics and the mystery of the, the universe and the mystery of the way mathematics works rather than over reduction. It's a bit like saying my mum is just the person who cares for me. You know, maths is just the numbers that add two and two, whereas a mother is much more, a father is much more, a book is much more, um, a gift is much more. There's a beauty in these things. And mathematics is the beauty of God's creation, celebrating that beauty of uh, God's uh, creation. Um, you briefly touch on deeper ways of looking at mathematics. If we do a Google search on um, philosophy and mathematics, there are theories of understanding mathematics. And one of the theories is idealism of Plato and Aristotle. And um, uh, certainly in Platonism, like Goodell's Platonism, we see there the belief that maths reflects the perfection of God, the beauty of God. And this is strongly held by many mathematicians and it's part of the excitement that mathematicians have in the study of maths is that they're really working with the language of God and that's the excitement that Einstein had and the excitement that many have had and we touch on secularist views if you're going to do an assignment on this it would be valuable to include other viewpoints including more secular viewpoints and so some of the other viewpoints are mentioned here. Some people say that mathematics is part of logical thinking. And so what we're doing when we do maths is we are using logical thinking approaches. The question then comes, do these systems of logic come from God, who, who is the author of logic, or do they come from humans who um, develop logic um, uh, or where does the logic come from? Another approach is the intuitive approach. And an intuitive approach says we instinctively understand maths. The formalism approach says that maths has forms. So two plus two equals four. We've created these forms. We've created these rules. It's like a game of chess or drafts. You create the rules and then the game works because you've created the rules or forms. This is called formalism. And then predictivism is uh, ways of seeing maths as involved in prediction. So these are different ways of understanding maths. Others see it as computational. Others see it as relating to sets. Um, but it is amazing that numbers do what they do. And this is why so many follow Plato and follow the Old and New Testament in seeing maths as celebrating God's creation, as in the Psalms that we uh, read as well. Leone, do you have thoughts on um, maths? Have we oversimplified it by separating it from God? Um, how did you find the readings on maths and connection with theology? Leone? Um, I really enjoyed the readings on maths. Um, 
I so really didn't like maths when I was in school. And during the week, I actually had a conversation with one of the students in my class in um, year eight and I spoke to her about these things and and she was like ma'am I never knew about this everyone always just thinks of it as simple numbers and adding it up and subtracting but we don't think of it as um, something beautiful and something that is you that was used to create us and that we use as a language to understand God. So I I really think we lost something. (laughs) Yes. And the beauty of having the language of God, when we do addition or do um, subtraction, we have the language of God to be able to um, work through some of those uh, areas. Um, And this leads us then to the question, how do we overcome uh, the fear of maths? How do we overcome um, those? Um, And there's an interesting cartoon here, whereby who is putting the maths books in the horror section of the library? Um, Yeah, they're the scary books. (laughs) And then uh, a comment that one teacher uh, made was, if you had your way, you'd put the maths books in the must-read section of the library that uh, everyone has to uh, read. So different people have uh, different views on where maths belongs in the library. But one of the challenges is to overcome maths anxiety and to overcome the fear of maths. Um, Do we have thoughts on how we can help students overcome the fear of maths and maths anxiety because um, really maths anxiety comes from early experiences in schools where we're under too much pressure, we're under time pressure, we're uh, overcorrected for getting things wrong, Um, it's oversimplified, not celebrated, there's no space to get things uh, wrong. Um, So Hannah, do you have thoughts on how we can help overcome maths anxiety? Um, I think showing them the maths in what they're passionate about. Like I really love art, I love cooking, and to do follow a recipe you need to have, understand measurement and maths and to be able to get the right ratios, to get the taste right, and same with art. Like um, I can't remember who mentioned it before, but about like the golden ratio, like you have to be aware of proportions and then also to be able to like draw what you see but then you can also put your own perspective on it and change it and so I think showing combining it back with the other sections will take away some of the anxiety over it going oh I actually do this every day um Yeah, so good. So um, we can provide guidelines, uh, clarity. Uh, We can provide opportunity for creativity and uh, expression of uh, difference. As Karen has written, we can make it relevant, fun, hands-on, finding the interests of the students, listening to the students, finding um, activities. And so if we've got a student who's interested in model boats or model cars, we can do mathematics that relates to that. If we've got another student who's interested in sewing, um, we can do mathematics that uh, has to do with uh, uh, measuring out uh, clothing and making clothing. So there's lots of hands-on activities that we can do. Um, We can encourage students to recognise it's okay to get answers uh, wrong. Patchwork quilting you could do is a very interesting area of uh, mathematics and encourage students that mathematics does not have to be uh, rushed. Um, And so um, we can look at the ways in which um, we can identify the causes of anxiety. So we can ask students um, why do they get anxious um, in terms of doing maths and how we can overcome that. And there have been articles written on anxiety and maths anxiety as well. And so if you just go to uh, Google and uh, you type in uh, mathematics anxiety, then it'll bring 
bring up uh, lots of articles on uh, why do students have maths anxiety? What is it and how do we overcome maths anxiety? Um, what's its origins, what's it causes, and what are some helpful ways um, that we are able to overcome maths anxiety. And the same with science anxiety, sports anxiety. There can be lots of other subjects where students have anxiety. So many people think of mathematics as um, logical, impersonal, um, but um, many students have negative responses. So they've had bad experiences with maths. And when you have a bad experience, this affects your thinking. And so we're talking about critical thinking. Critical thinking is encouraged and helped when you have safe spaces where things can be worked through. And uh, critical thinking slows down when we have fear or um, want to flee working through a problem. And so students do much better when we can lower the anxiety that they have. And you and I will do much better when we have low levels of anxiety. Notice here we've got scholarly writing about maths anxiety that has scholarly references in each paragraph. So we can learn from that. Um, studies show that anxiety interrupts the working memory. So you don't think well when you have anxiety. Your students don't think well when they have anxiety. Um, and uh, they'll often avoid mathematics subjects and courses and careers. And that could be a real shame um, because that could be uh, the very thing that's going to be helpful to them and get them the sort of job that they want. Maths anxiety can also be an obstacle for teachers in that teachers can often have uh, anxiety there. Um, so what are some of the symptoms and causes of anxiety? So anxiety, people might go white, they might sweat. What are the causes? Negative beliefs and thinking about maths, negative experiences from parents and teachers. And uh, um, what are some of the solutions um, that we uh, can come up with? Uh, we can look at giving safe space, we can look at giving support, we can look at giving uh, more time, all of that can uh, help the students to overcome. So the emphasis on one correct answer can cause anxiety. Um, Modelling where there's no room for mistakes, and I've been there myself, whereby you work something through. And if the teacher um, uh, sees that you've made one little mistake, they can come down really heavily on you for that one little mistake instead of encouraging you for having a go. So we need to encourage safe spaces to fail to get things wrong. Um, it's not about how to get the answer. It's about how to work through the challenges and to work through uh, the difficulties um, and so that can be very, very useful. I want to take a few moments now to uh, reflect um, firstly on the maths wars. There are some uh, who say that maths should be about tradition, the old way of rote learning. And then there are others who say that we should be more creative in the way we teach maths. So if you see the term maths wars, then you can see that it relates to this whole discussion of whether we're rote learning, same with the spelling wars or the English education wars. There's a whole background to these different ways of seeing uh, the way things are done. Um, and so, and again, if uh, your connection drops out, then uh, we can reconnect you. Or if my connection drops out, we can reconnect as well. Um, in this scholarly article that I brought up before, primary 
um, school teachers' beliefs relating to mathematics teaching. What I found interesting here is the way in which maths is often used in scholarly writing. And so um, if you want to understand the beliefs of teachers about mathematics, you can often use maths to understand these uh, beliefs. Uh, notice in this scholarly article that they begin with a theoretical background or a literary review where they go through, this is what people believe. We've got scholarly references in brackets with the date. Many people would include the page numbers in that referencing. And then from that, they identify the different beliefs about maths that people have developed. And so there are a number of articles like this that you may find useful to review. The method that you go about doing your assignment can be important. And so you might want to write a paragraph or more on the method that you've used in this assignment. And in this assignment, they've interviewed teachers and they've written down what they believe and what they practice in terms of uh, maths. And then there's a questionnaire. And the weakness is, uh, what questions you ask and how you ask them. Notice that in this survey, they've used a Likert scale. Hands up those who've seen the Likert scale. So the Likert scale is where you have one to five, where five is very often and one is almost never. And uh, rather than yes, no, which has got two categories, um, having uh, five can be more useful. And notice the way they're using maths, a five-point scale, to become more accurate. The question is, could you use a 10-point scale or a 20-point scale? Um, and here they've decided the five-point scale will be useful. Um, they're specifying the number of um, survey forms that they've used. So 1,500 survey forms sent at random to grade one to seven teachers. And so to me, that sounds like um, that's a huge survey. You can do surveys on one, two or three people. Um, and so you can have um, a number of different uh, numbers that you could use. Notice that they've uh, given different grade levels, different school systems, different socioeconomic areas as well. Uh, they only had a return rate of 398 or 27%. So um, it wasn't such a high return rate. Notice the way they use percentages in the results that they get. And so I use assessment to help me evaluate how effective my teacher has been, um, 0.75 um, and so on. So maths is very important in critical thinking in research. Um, in doing surveys. It's a very important tool in order to um, understand even maths itself and how we uh, do um, well at maths. So um, I just share that as an example of a scholarly resource that uses maths to study the teaching of maths. Um, so we've briefly looked at mathematics and the ways in which we study it and look at maths. I want to now switch over to looking at science education. Um, and then in the next two weeks, we're going to go on and start looking at the humanities and looking at um, the other ways of understanding the world around us. And so that's very interesting as well. And we'll go on and we'll look at emotions and we'll uh, look further at the more subjective uh, approaches. And we can look at poetry as a way of understanding the world, art as a way of understanding the world. That's in the weeks to come. But today we're looking at maths and science education. And one of the things that um, uh, we um, need to uh, reflect on from the previous week is that we continue to be influenced by the historical influences from the past. And so notice today, I'm continuing to quote from um, the ancient Greek authors 
and from the Bible and the Hebrew and Christian authors and the Gospels, because Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they had insights into the nature of mathematics in which they saw maths as the realm of God and the metaphysical, which can be lost today in our modern world when it focuses on just getting results and it simplifies the maths and science processes. The argument is that something's lost when we ignore the lessons of history and the rich ways in which people saw maths and science in the past with Leonardo da Vinci, with Isaac Newton and others in the past. And through the medieval or middle ages times, from the ancient Greeks through to the present time, there have also been a lot of great thinkers like Augustine and Aquinas. Um, before we move on, one of the great thinking mathematicians of the past was Euclid. And Euclid, um, his book, did you know, was one of the top selling books of all time after the Bible. Now, you and I, many of us, wouldn't necessarily read Euclid, but it's nonetheless, it's still there and able to be read. So somewhere there should be Euclid's resources on maths. It's disappeared. Where has Euclid gone? Oh, here it is. So um, here's a copy of uh, Euclid's Elements of uh, Mathematics and particularly Trigonometry. And people still build on uh, this. And so this is from 2000 years ago. Um, and Euclid was an ancient Greek thinker. And you can uh, look up uh, Euclid. And so. Let's look up Euclid and his mathematics. So Euclid's called um, one of the first thinkers in maths, 300 years BC in Athens, in Greece. And we're still using his books today. So geometry is the science of figured space, wrote Euclid. It can have one, two, or three dimensions, and you can use lines to describe um, this space, including straight lines and circles and parallel lines. You often begin in maths with a point. It's a position that has no dimensions, and then move to a line which has length without breadth, and then lines can intersect. And if you put lines together, you can have a, uh, have a plane and a figure, and uh, Euclid can be really useful. So if you want to really surprise everyone with a older copy of a maths book, then go to gutenberg.org um, and download a copy of Euclid's Geometry. Um, one of the other books that I found was uh, Galen's um, uh, medical book, free online download. So this is a medical book from back from the ancient uh, Greeks, and you can actually download a copy of uh, Galium's um, medical book that was written 2,000 years ago. And I took that to my wife and family, and I said, there's some great medical here, and they weren't convinced. They said that a medical book that's 2,000 years old uh, has to be a little bit questionable. I'll leave it up to you whether you feel there's value in Galen's medical book. But it reminds us of the value of ancient writings. Um, they still speak to us today, and we still look back to those. And then in 1100 AD, there was a major change took place in that up until 1100 AD, and the Catholic Roman Church was dominant through the Middle Ages, um, the Pope gave permission and encouragement for the development of a university. And so in Padua, and in Oxford and Cambridge and Paris, they encouraged the development of a place where all the subjects came together, 
theology and maths. And uh, so you would be able to all gather together and share your resources. And that could be uh, very, very valuable, that place where you could um, gather together to share your resources. And so the universities were started 1100, 1200 AD. And one of the major things that you were encouraged to do there was to study God, to study theology. And all the way through to the 1800s, it was part of your studies. It was core of what you did because you'd celebrate and worship God as you would study. And then along came Martin Luther and the Reformation in which he challenged the dominance of tradition. And out of the Protestant reformed approach to thinking, we have the development of the scientific method. But interestingly, one of the founders of the scientific method um, and other founders of the scientific method um, uh, was a strong Protestant Christians like Isaac Newton, who wanted to find ways of uh, understanding the world around them. And so science, rather than excluding God, was actually built on ideas relating to faith and God. And if you want to read more about that, then uh, Peter Harrison, um, a scholar at University of Queensland, has written many books on science and religion. And in those, he shows that there's strong connections between science and religion, and there's many others as well. So Libby, what are your thoughts on some of the readings where we've tried to show that science and religion have been related in the past, and thus they shouldn't um, be too hastily separated um, in the present? Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, that observation by Peter Harrison and others that religion contributed to science, particularly God makes a good world and we have maths that underpins the good world, like um, the Greeks and Plato said, like the Bible and the Psalms and the Gospels say. And then, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Libby, this idea that God and science have a connection? Um, well, I like the bit in um, there was a philosophy talk was talking about um, the Big Bang um, mm. and how the science in the Big Bang where it, it it says that there's nothing and then the Big Bang happened but there's actually in nothing there wasn't really nothing at all they're saying there had to be something there with all those tiny little particles um, and coming then had to be a cause of that to happen so something had to come together to perform it so um, they've tried to take away the God aspect of God created the world with a purpose. Um, and yeah, so that was just one of my thoughts. So I think that there had to be initial cause for both of those events to happen, but um, the Christian side of it is obviously believing that there was a designer. And so I think that's easier to believe in a designer than something that the same as nothing. Yeah, so good. And Georges Lemaitre is the uh, Catholic Belgian priest who uh, first puts forward from mathematical observations about the nature of the universe that it must have come from nothing. Um, and then Edward Hubble has since studied that and others have uh, studied the origins of the Big Bang. Um, he was educated at a Jesuit secular uh, secondary school, rather a, a Christian uh, secondary uh, school. And in studying astronomy, um, he saw that. Now, Einstein originally rejected the view. He said that um, there was a finitely sized static universe. However, um, at Oxford, they have the blackboard where Einstein taught in 1930, um, Einstein um, blackboard on the origins of the universe. And on that, um, he has 
um, written in 1931 that um, he not only accepts Lemaitre's observation, but he then goes on to work out the age of the universe, and they've now worked it out as 13.7 billion years. And this really, for many physicists, points back to there has to be a God in that if the universe comes into being 13.7 uh, billion years ago, then um, uh, it must happen. So Einstein um, uh, refused to accept the accepting universe. But as I say, if you go to um, the uh, blackboard that he has still at Oxford uh, Uni in 1931, then he actually shows the expanding uh, universe there. And the sad thing is that I find that they don't actually acknowledge, I don't think, Lemaitre's contribution to their, that at Oxford, which I think is quite puzzling to me in that um, uh, it's clearly Lemaitre has this influence on Einstein later accepting the expanding universe and then working out um, what occurs. Yeah. Hannah, what are your thoughts on uh, science and um, uh, God? Is it helpful? Do we sometimes need to separate God and science? What are your thoughts, Hannah? Um, I think science, again, like I was saying before, it gives us a way to understand and look at God's creation and without God being there, we wouldn't have necessarily science to do, I guess. It's, yeah. I yeah. think you need God with the science because if you take him out of it, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers really. I really like what you say there, Hannah, as um, uh, you need God with science in that if you take him out, uh, you take God out, you take out the metaphysics, you take out the meaning, you take out the origins, you take out the purposes, you take out the ultimate concerns. Uh, and so God brings in these very big questions. So science is not just a tool and maths is not just a tool. It's a tool for understanding the good universe, the goodness of the universe and how it should be used and um, what the meaning and purpose of it is. So I think um, uh, that's uh, really important. Matilda, what are your thoughts on God and science and the importance of the connection and the value of the connection between God and science? Um, like I had mentioned previously, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, um, I feel like, you know, science actually proves God's creation um, now like scientists are now figuring out and they have in the past as well but there's often been a lot of denial there um, but scientists often see that um, scientists often see that science supports creation uh, rather than supporting the big bang theory we actually see that it comes in and you know God's designed it like that he's designed it that way so that you know, what he's made will support the fact that he has made it. And um, I, I think that they they shouldn't be separated. Absolutely not. I think that there are a lot of, you know, there's stories of Christian scientists who actually have to leave their field because, um, you know, they're like, I can't, I can't deny the fact that, you know, God is real, but, you know, what I'm, what I'm studying and the people that I'm with, they won't let me believe it. So I've actually got to leave. So um, I think you can't separate science and God because, you know, science just proves creation. Yeah, that's so well said. Now, one of the things that certainly stands out in the history of science and faith is that there can be a problem placing too much value on tradition because tradition or interpretation or men's views um, is going to shape how we think. And so there are people like Stephen Hawkins 
um, who uh, is not so keen on using God in the discussion um, of the origins of the universe. It is the view of a person. And there are times when human views get in the ways of truth and reality. And we certainly see that with Galileo and the earth around the sun. Um, people believe that the sun moved around the earth, but it was not so much because of church tradition, but because of Greek tradition. And the traditions of the Greeks like Ptolemy were strongly held to. And the argument that if you just look back to tradition and don't look in new ways, then you can miss the reality of what's going on. And Galileo was saying, let's use new instruments, telescopes, and let's look at things in new ways. And so science is often about looking at things in new ways. At the same time, I don't think you can get free of tradition. I think tradition is always there. You just need to realise it influences you and it can shape your thoughts. And that's what assignment two was about, was understand the traditions that have influenced you. And the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther wasn't wanting to totally get rid of tradition, I think, but was wanting to examine the tradition, to reflect on it, to study it, and to see whether it held truth, particularly the giving of uh, payment to help a building fund and whether that could overcome sin. And you can download uh, Martin uh, Luther's um, uh, writings on uh, that as well. And so he challenged Luther challenged the dominance of tradition and others who've been involved in the development of the scientific method have also challenged the dominance of tradition and they've looked at evidence and evidence based they've looked at observations they've looked at experiments and testing and as Peter Harrison has shown in his writing on science and religion they were often Christian people and there were Christian origins to seeing that the goodness of God meant that there was a world to be studied out there and that we should not only read the Bible, we should also read the natural world. And a lot of science was reading the natural world because there were Christians who believed God had written about the natural world in the natural creation. And this is sometimes called natural theology and Alistair McGrath, um, uh, from uh, Oxford has written about this more recently on natural theology and helped us to understand the world uh, around us. Um, and so uh, the, also the other thing that Peter Harrison uh, writes about is sin and the nature of science. That is, Christians recognised the limitations of sin and the limitations of knowledge, and this led them to develop scientific methods through um, uh, experiments, testing, refuting, observing, verification, peer review, publication, in order to help overcome the limits of sin. So there's a connection there between science and what we know about God and history. What has happened, of course, is people have forgotten about the Christian origins of science, and now we live in a world that just focuses on science. They've forgotten about Christian origins of mathematics and the Plato and the Greek origins, and they just focus on maths as a tool. And we live in a consumerist age in which everyone focuses on just using things as tools. The danger with this is that it can lead to using people as tools, and we treat people just as uh, tools as well. Now, this leads to some questions about the scientific method. And so um, we could then think more deeply about the scientific method. Can I get everyone to write down what are three or four steps in the scientific method? And we'd have more as well. So what are the methods that are used in science? <coughs> Uh, 
So Rene Descartes, who was a Christian thinker, talked about in maths and science, um, there are methods that we use. And one of the dangers of teaching maths and science is we can spoon fill, feed our students too much instead of the discovery method where we encourage students to discover. So there could be a danger in too much spoon feeding. We want to encourage students to um, move away from just rote learning in maths and science to discovery. Um, one of the things I think that we're doing is we're forming a problem. We're asking questions. I like what Hannah writes, observe, gather the data, analyze, test it, confirm, is it repeatable? And Marissa writes, uh, hypothesis, we observe, we looking for results that are reproducible, we're looking for critical analysis. Um, Matilda, do you have thoughts on what methods would you uh, use? Sorry, I just missed some of that. I don't know why, but it's just cut out. I got the Matilda of what methods I would use. Can you just yeah, so just one or two methods, methods that you see as valuable in the scientific approach, the scientific method. Oh, as in um, like, you know, um, observation and, mm. um, you know, gathering, gathering research with controlled and uncontrolled variables and things like that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. I'm just trying to think. Um, <laughs> Which ones do you see as particularly things. important for students and um, uh, helping them to critically think um, out of all of these different methods? You, you've got observing, you've got testing, you've got controls. Um, yeah, there's quite a few different approaches, aren't there? Which ones do you see as particularly important? Yeah. Um, I actually think that getting students to make a hypothesis, what they think is going to happen first, um, because then they're, you know, using their own thinking what from what they've seen before to go, okay, what do I think is going to happen or to just make an assumption? And then they actually get to, you know, go through all the steps of, um, doing the research, doing the tests, and then getting their, you know, variables, learning which ones to control and not control. Um, and so it's teaching them to, you know, upfront put down their assumptions and what they think is going to happen. Um, and then they slowly get to find out the actual results, whether that's um, proved, uh, proven or unproven by the time they've finished. And also, yeah, yeah. further thoughts? Mm. Um, no, that's, sorry, that's as much as I could come up with right now. Yeah. I, th I think that's so good in that uh, if you get the students to try these different approaches, um, again, it's likely that you'll encourage them that they they can get things wrong at times. Uh, one of the interesting examples I saw over this last week is the making of a French croissant. And apparently if you take some uh, of the flaky pastry and you put a, sheet, uh, a layer of butter and fold it over, that could be a croissant. And if you fold it over again, that could be a croissant. And so what they've done in the croissant making factories is they fold it once, layer of butter, fold it again, layer of butter. Does anyone know how many times they fold it and put a layer of butter? Any hands going up? Hannah, it's actually 12. And if you put only one, two or three, then it's too stodgy. And if you put about um, 18, 19 or 20, it blows up too much as the, and, and tw around 12. So it could be seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, but 12 is what they often uh, use. And so again, they've got to get it wrong to few folds, get it wrong to many folds in order to find the perfect one in the middle. And that reminds us that students need a safe place where they can get things wrong. And science is about trying different ways of doing things, uh, comparing the different uh, approaches. And we have a, a lot of different sciences, don't we? Um, uh, whereby um, they try these different uh, uh, approaches. So uh, the scientific method um, uses 
these uh, different approaches. Um, and so Isaac Newton was one of the uh, great scholars who used these scientific methods. And he said he was looking at God's handiwork. Um, others have said, um, Eddington said, God's the great mathematician and he's looking at his handiwork. Even um, in uh, Michelangelo's drawings, uh, we see that there's an attempt to describe the beauty and handiwork of God in uh, maths and in uh, science. And so um, one of the things we've tried to focus on today is the different ways in which we can understand God at work in the universe. Can I get everyone to write down what are two or three things that have stood out to you from today? So we've looked at maths, we've looked at maths anxiety, we've looked at uh, maths and religion, we've then briefly looked at science and religion, and we've seen that historically there's a strong connection with an ordered God who creates an ordered world, that we are challenged to understand that order, particularly in um, uh, post-Reformation, Calvinist times, um, we had a responsibility to understand the laws of the universe, and science is part of uh, that study of the laws of the universe through the study of nature, and then uh, um, overcoming uh, sin, which is uh, those difficulties that limit our understanding of the universe. And then we've briefly looked at the scientific method and there's much that's written on that. So I don't think we need to go further and deeper with the scientific uh, method that can be done. What we're doing that is any hands need to go up or speak with further questions about assignment two. So if you do ask now. Otherwise, I might just ask a couple, Libby. Uh, yes, Hannah, you've got a question. Sorry, I was just asking, is there a minimum number of references needed for assignment two? I think really, I'd say eight to 12 min, uh, minimum. Um, and I'd say 12 will look better. Sometimes you can get away with eight if they're really strong references and well used. But I tend to find the more references that are good scholarly references that you use, the better you do. I find that you'll majorly focus on a smaller number than that. It might be four or five, but you'll have others as well that are fillers that fill it in. And I would say many of your paragraphs should have more than one reference in the paragraph. If you only have one, it tends to be a summary. If you have more than one, you set up a bit of dialogue and interaction with those resources. So I'd say more than one reference per paragraph. Um, and even in the personal reflection type paragraphs, it'd be worth having a reference or so in there as well. Yeah. Any other questions about the assignments? Hands up or questions or any further ones, Hannah? Uh, and you can always send me an email too if you have further questions on the way. So I certainly uh, appreciate that. Um, Libby, can you just tell us a couple of things that stood out to you today? Um, I like the discussion on the reasons behind math anxiety, um, especially because it's personal for me. Um, and I think for me, there's a bit of emphasis on there's that one correct answer um, and also a fear of getting the wrong answer and some of the negative, probably the pressure. My, my dad was very, very good at math and I think he didn't understand why I didn't get it. Um, and so I probably just tried to do the answers without actually understanding the why and how it can be useful um, in, in life experiences. So, yeah. Um, and I think taking that, being aware of the anxieties that can actually help in the teaching as well. So try and find, understand where students might be coming from and finding solutions so we can fix those and help them along. Yeah, find that's great. Yeah, it's terrific. 
All right, we might draw to a close there because you've got a lot of things on your plate, a lot of things uh, to do, but I certainly appreciate uh, your uh, involvement at this time. I really appreciate the work that you've been uh, doing on your assignments and in this subject and in all of your subjects. I'm sure you gain a great deal about it. Uh, um, I, I feel as you face the challenges of the pressures, um, that you are being wise, that you're focusing on key ideas in the assignments and you're balancing work as well. The, I recognise you've got work commitments. So appreciate all the effort that you're putting in and I'm sure you're learning a great deal that is uh, valuable. Um, I'll just close in prayer and let's commit what we have learned to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on uh, your handiwork in the world around us. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the ways in which you've encouraged us and helped us today to see maths as uh, not something that's uh, totally out of our reach or a total cause of anxiety, but something that's a tool given by God but at times it can be a tool that we need to learn more about. We pray that you'd help us to help others to overcome the anxieties and challenges we sometimes face. We thank you for the scientists who've gone before, who've developed uh, methods that have given us modern medicines, that have given help in so many areas. Lord, help us to be clear thinking, helpful people in our teaching and in our lives and to be thoughtful and prayerful and careful in all of the things we do and think. Uh, amen. So thank you, each one. I look forward to uh, catching up with you all and to uh, next time. And uh, thank you for your involvement and your commitment. Thank you. And if you have further questions, feel free to hang on and to ask those questions. Otherwise, farewell uh, if you've got to go. Thank you. So do you have a question, Hannah? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, because um, there's the three weeks of holidays. It will be yes. four weeks until we meet again. Is that right? That's right, yes. And I might yeah. send an and email then... out just reminding. Yes. Yeah, and I just wanted to check, is the time going to stay the same from 2 o'clock till 4 o'clock or will it go back to the original time? Because I wasn't no, sure when we just stay 2 till 4, yeah. So I think cool. it's uh, helpful for everyone to keep it 2 to 4 and it's helpful um, for others who have challenges with the time frame. So 2 to 4 will work really well. So I'll send an email cool. out on that too. Brilliant. Thank you. So four weeks.